So, so uh, welcome everyone. I, I'm writing this all on a new screen rather than having things prepared because that just turns out to be what ends up uh, what ends up working. So we'll just uh, go with that. So, uh, so welcome. So uh, let's see. Right, right now, people can just uh, again check with the uh, uh, with the uh, shepherds. You can see me in the slides, right? Or yes. Ah, oh, great. Okay, good. Shepard, just interrupt if you have interesting questions to say. So, so today, here's my, here's my plan. Uh, I want to basically set the stage, uh, which means that if I think about what I want to talk about, then I want to talk uh, about the course, about the pseudo course. And I think that will take about an hour, uh, but I realize I shouldn't do that. So I'll talk about it a bit. And, then, and also talk a bit of philosophy about mathematics. Uh, to also set the stage. And then finally, uh, I want to start moving toward algebraic geometry. I won't actually get there because I think category theory or maybe sheaves is as far as we're going to go. Okay, so, the, uh, so uh, this, is, this is the first meeting of this experiment. And uh, for many of you like me, the experiment's a few weeks old. Uh, and so this will be a little bit different than the ones later on because I want to describe what might happen and how we might get there and what might change. Uh, so the, to set the stage, the, the ongoing pandemic arrived relatively suddenly and kind of uh, overturned and disrupted a great deal. So there's a terrible human cost, and I hope everyone and everyone you love is safe and well, but I also know that um, uh, for some of you, people you know are not safe and well. So, um, so, uh, and also, our, I should mention, our struggles in, in this new situation have made uh, ongoing injustice is more obvious than the U.S. at least, uh, but there's also some renewed sense of solidarity uh, and that we're all in this together. So uh, I'm doing this because there's an opportunity right now when things are grim to do things that are hopeful and do things that are new and try out new structures and habits that might last beyond the current moment. So, uh, and so I'm following the lead of pe many people like Daniel Litt or Jared Alper and Isabel Vogt who acted immediately and tried new things as soon as things were shutting down. Okay, so here's the plan. Uh, so really, th I'm thinking more, here's the game we're playing with the, with the constraints uh, we have, and we'll see how to proceed as we go. So uh, my initial intent was to have less, an open, free introduction to algebraic geometry. Uh, and because I thought about it at a certain level, uh, roughly at, uh, in the US, a pre-research, but otherwise advanced graduate level, uh, and I have notes uh, on which to, uh, uh, and I have notes uh, I can use as a skeleton to build on. That's what I'm going to. That's what I'm doing, and I'm doing it at this level because that's basically what I have to offer. Uh, and let's see if I do this right. And when I do that, that should ideally update the notes in the Dropbox too. Okay. So uh, what is this thing going to be? I don't know if you've seen my great picture, Cecilia uh, Pali's uh, Peep, but uh, I want to say that this is not a course. It's and this this is not a lecture. Uh, and so uh, we could take the traditional model, uh, which is an academic course, and fit it to the circumstances and let that guide what happens. Uh, but I think it's not the right way to go. Uh, and I think it's a standard human mistake with new technology to try to use it in the same way as the technology we're used to. Uh, and so only when people are born into the new technology do we finally see how it's best used. So it's true for smartphones. It was definitely true for schemes and stacks, uh, but we can still try to free ourselves from old models and try to see what the new ones actually tell us to do. Uh, so here's some guiding principles that I can think of. Uh, also, those of you teaching in universities know that the academy is going through, I, I think, literally a couple of decades of rapid evolution in technology use after a long period of stasis. And uh, we're doing this over a few months. And those of you who are students are experiencing the brunt of it. And it's not a pleasant process, but uh, such is life. So, uh, okay, so here's some principles that I want to uh, let guide what we want to do. So the, 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 the goal should be that it should be as available as possible to people, which means people with sufficient background. Uh, but that means that ideally we want few, bar too few ter technological barriers. Uh, and that also means ideally it should be free for everyone. And this is now possible, thanks very much to uh, the generosity of people who make things free. Uh, and also in order for it to work, it should be as little work as possible uh, for me uh, around what's really necessary because if it's a lot of work for me, I'm not going to be able to do it. Uh, and it also should be as little work as possible 
for you outside of the intellectual work of learning. So, uh, so, it, so I don't mean it should be easy, but it should be, uh, it, but it, all useless work should not, should, there should be no, as little useless work as possible. Uh, and so other goals will be, tr will be to try to uh, invent some structures and experiment with them that make it easy, uh, that make it somehow easy to learn or natural to learn. Uh, I, and to, uh, and actually, uh, I should say, Gal Gross in her, um, her sign up form uh, mentioned this notion I looked up that really is great. You should look this up. It's a notion of, notion of, a, uh, of a shelling point. I don't know whether I'm saying the name correctly. Uh, to try to set up structures that, that guide people to doing good things naturally. Uh, and so this takes advantage of the fact that you're human, uh, or most of you are human. Uh, and uh, so, in particular, community building uh, in many different ways and making use of, I guess, the phrase is pure accountability, but just the fact that it's way easier to do things in a group. I find it way easier as well. Uh, and so uh, something I want to discuss maybe another day is that mathematics is, uh, is one of the most social of the intellectual disciplines. Uh, and people have this idea that it's have the opposite idea, but they don't know what they're, they have no experience with it. Uh, so uh, this is what will be necessary to make things work. Uh, and then finally, the, the challenge that I can't, uh, that I am not sure how to deal with is that, you know, is that there's a way broader group of backgrounds than I expected. Um, and I, we could just say, well, it's only for some people, but I think it'd be great if we could try to keep as many people as possible by doing things at several levels uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, so, so, uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Okay, so those are the, those are the, those are the, uh, that, that kind of sets the rules of the game. Uh, so, now, so, okay, what's, so that, now here's the structure of what will, uh, what the pseudo course might look like. Which is, okay, so, so, so we'll have, pseudo lectures every Saturday or most Saturdays uh, and let's say until roughly early to mid-September and that's actually not so many uh, of course the amount of time would in our Stanford quarter would take us about a third of the way into one quarter but the difference is here these are given the principles only a small part even if they're a key part of the course uh, so they kind of can only set the stage for most of what actually is going to happen so most of after that should happen in built, the built structures, the, stru the stuff we built up. Uh, and uh, so, that, so uh, and then basically it has to happen by self-organization, although we'll try to give prompts uh, or try, suggest things to try. Um, and so mathematically, how is it gonna work if you are, if you have all these different levels? Well, if you're not comfortable with writing proofs uh, that, and coming up with proofs, it's going to be really challenging because this is not well aimed at you, but hopefully you'll still get something out of it. Uh, but if you've seen proofs uh, and have used them uh, and don't know what a module is, then I think there's really an opportunity here to, although it might be challenging. And I, I think it's a paradox that the people who have the least mathematical maturity, which I, I do, which is, as any mathematician knows, is not an insult. It just means lack of practice and experience, uh, are, are going to somehow need the most in order to understand what's going on. Uh, and uh, and, I, and um, um, as you can ask the experienced mathematicians who are present too, that somehow the more you know, the more comfortable you are with attending talks and watching things where you understand less. And it doesn't mean you just fall asleep, but it means you actually have trained your attention to try to grab at those bits of information uh, uh, that in this uh, in this vast ocean of confusion, so you can actually have something to to hold on to. So at worst, maybe you'll get a chance to practice that, and also when reading to learn how to read mathematically. Uh, and then if you're at the level uh, that the rising C notes were initially aimed for, say roughly graduate level, uh, but not necessarily a future algebraic geometer, or maybe an expert in a different part of math, then I think we can talk about schemes and get someplace interesting. So my plan for the for the next eight to ten weeks, though, is not to cover everything, uh, but uh, so the story for this episode uh, for the, uh, until September is going to be basically about what's the notion of a geometric space. We have, there are various things we think of intuitively as a, as a geometric space. 
Uh, and this could be things like a variety or a manifold or even a topological space, or, or if you're very fancy, it can be an algebraic space. Uh, uh, if you're super fancy, it can be a stack. Uh, and so that, um, and to understand, to try to figure out what is the common way we use to, to, to talk about such things, uh, and it'll be as a ring space that, uh, I, that it, and I'll say, well, I'm not gonna reveal the end of the story, although you can of course look for the last page. Uh, and so uh, the prerequisites to follow along should ideally be, uh, so here's the prerequisites, is that ideally it's uh, comfort with coming up with proofs. Uh, ideally, it should be some commutative algebra, not uh, uh, more than ideally, I think, but not necessarily, uh, not necessarily a huge amount, but groups, fields, rings, ideals, and modules, uh, uh, and I feel like the borderline might be tensor products, things that, that's something you might not have seen but can learn. Uh, some point set topology. Uh, and then I guess uh, some intestinal fortitude to figure out things out as they go and to sort of figure out things you have not actually seen. Okay, so now I'm getting closer to actually uh, talking about mathematics. Uh, so let me, uh, but let me first talk a little bit about uh, it may be idiosyncratic point of view on, on learning mathematics. And this, I don't know if it's a majority point of view, it's probably a minority point of view, but I think it's the kind of point of view I know the shepherds, for example, have, and many people I know have, but it's uh, maybe not quite Bourbac East. Um, so, uh, so, so in order to try to learn as much as possible, uh, uh, so I'm gonna try to explain um, as much as we need And I'm going to try to explain as little as possible. So, uh, so maybe I feel I realized again and again that this lo this this slogan maybe rearranged in different ways. Uh, I'm going to try to say as, as little category theory as possible, but as much as we need. Uh, one other uh, so another thing that's important when you're that I think when you even some graduate students don't fully get yet is that it's important to know what you know. And also know what you don't know, by which I mean uh, be very well aware of things you don't know. Don't wave your hands. Uh, and the, like, a, a very big warning for uh, in any class is if someone doesn't know what they don't know. So uh, try to be honest and scrupulous. Don't try to impress anyone. Uh, and uh, know when you're waving your hands and feel guilty when you're waving your, hand, your hands, but sometimes you just have to feel guilty. Um, so uh, understand what you can prove. Uh, don't just nod your head. Uh, and so, and then how do we actually learn mathematics? Well, I guess traditionally what you do uh, is someone will write on the board and axioms and then theorem and then proof and then another theorem and then proof and maybe a corollary. Uh, and that's, I feel, not how I really learn or how humans learn. Uh, so what, what, what do we actually do? Well, well, we start off with some idea, uh, which is roughly, which is vague, uh, and intuition we're trying to understand, and then, may, then we'll formalize what we're actually talking about, so we can make precise what we're talking about, and then we abstract it to realize we're, we're talking about something more, uh, 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 we're, uh, about what the structures we're talking about, and then we realize it applies to more general situations, which lets us uh, get better Intuition. We realize that suddenly, uh, the suddenly uh, the uh, what we're thinking about applies to these other circumstances, which lets us understand things more and more and more. So, it is, uh, so uh, in particular, uh, pure mathematics is really an empirical science. So we don't you, you don't just make stuff up for the sake of making. Probably, stuff probably up. we got a request that you update the uh, slides in the that's Dropbox. Not, that is a good. Yeah, that's something which I have to. I was warned by Yifei Zhao that I would. I have to get used all the time to do that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Please keep, do that again. All right, also, we'll, you know, we'll, I, I will interrupt you. All yeah. done. Thanks, and also let me know if I start to speed up uh, in speaking when things oh, get yeah, yeah, more yeah. Okay, so uh, great. So there's a, so uh, in particular, I think, so there's a, so I was at, uh, this is at a conference in Sweden, not that it matters, but Sergei Shadrin, who's a mathematician now in the, in, in the Netherlands, uh, early in his talk, said this thing as a slogan. He was very vigorous, and he basically shouted it out, and I wanted to stand up and cheer. Which he said, 
where we don't want definitions, we want properties. Uh, so what matters are not definitions, but properties, and that properties, uh, then the properties are what should guide what the definitions are. Uh, and I guess ideally, this is a picture of him, I guess, uh, jumping up and down uh, uh, to, in, uh, to say this. I guess he's saying his own name, it appears. Uh, and uh, and so, so related to this is the importance of naming. And so some things deserve, uh, uh, like when you're young, you're told things and you just are supposed to accept them. This is a group. This is the definition of a group. Here are the axioms to remember. Uh, and, uh, but in fact, some things are important enough to deserve names. Some things have names and really shouldn't have them. Some of them have the wrong names. And there's nothing wrong with uh, disagreeing with, uh, uh, with the conventional wisdom on these things or demanding that someone explain why you should care. And so in particular, the question you should always ask is, why is a, like, why is a group, not what is a group? Uh, and then if you know why a group is and what it's trying to capture, then you get the definition. Uh, and the definition may not, the one, then you don't have to remember it. You just know, you just know it. And you may not have memorized the perfect axioms, but you will, have you will know something equivalent to them. And that's all that really uh, matters. And, uh, okay, so uh, next thing is the notion I'm gonna use of easy and hard uh, in a non-traditional sense, which is uh, if you think about things in mathematics in, the, in terms of what you actually understand, there are things that are easy, which means that they're easy to remember, you know how to, uh, uh, that you know without thinking how it works. Uh, maybe it's a proof where you just follow your nose and it proves itself. And hard is something which, uh, which is something which seems to come out of nowhere, which you've not dissolved uh, in your head to make it something natural. So easy could be technically very difficult and hard can be technically very easy, but very clever. So, uh, but I think that's the real, uh, so that's the real notion which matters for us. Okay, so now I feel like we're not, uh, I still feel very guilty that we're not getting to any math yet, but that's okay. Um, uh, the, the next thing is you have to do problems. And it's that you have to get your hands dirty and mathematics is not a passive activity. Uh, Feynman had a quote which uh, were on my slides, which I'm not using now, which essentially is that if you can't calculate something, you don't understand it. Uh, so, uh, so the goal is not to recite something. You have to actually understand it and be able to find your way uh, around it in the dark, uh, just using your hands. Uh, and in particular, there's a question of when you do problems on a, on a problem set, and the problem I'm hoping you'll try now is the uh, a standard question is, uh, I will, I'll get in all sorts of classes is, here's my solution, now what's the right way to do it? And then the solution in question is several pages long and maybe there's a four liner, but, uh, but any hard fought solution, uh, even an incomplete solution uh, is actually better than a red solution, than something that's the right solution that you just read. Uh, you can always read the right solution after, but your understanding only comes with that, with that after trying and even Failing is fine, but you have to fail before you look at the right solution. And so in particular, if you are, this is a problem that you're discussing with other people and you don't know the answer, don't look up the answer. Just be satisfied with the fact that you don't know what the answer is and be bothered by that and worry about it later. Don't just look up the answer and take a shortcut. And related to that is an important rule is that please, when you're doing any of the problems, do not post solutions online. Uh, and why? Uh, it's because, well, why would you post solutions online? You're not actually helping anyone by doing that. Uh, it's, and you're actually hurting people because it makes it possible for them to not struggle at something. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, if, please don't, if you find someone doing it, please ask them to stop. Uh, and it's not because we need questions to grade people on because there are no grades here. This is, uh, this is, this is because we care about, about knowledge and mathematics. Okay, great. So maybe, uh, uh, maybe a, as we near uh, the halfway part mark point, and I want to, uh, I want to uh, get to mathematics for the uh, uh, for the uh, second half. I just want to give one last thing, which I'll, I'll describe as a parable of the musicians, which is uh, maybe to 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 lead up to it. I, I presume many of you 
have already noticed and know well that, uh, that uh, let me first update this. Uh, that that you've noticed something that uh, like people go to college in the states and they get these very heavy uh, massive textbooks and they feel very important because they're carrying heavy mathematics around and yet as the courses get more and more complicated the books get thinner and thinner uh, and, uh, and that there's a reason for that and that's because somehow the more you understand the less you have to memorize uh, and then you can concentrate on memorizing the things that's really hard to memorize and, and this, and I, I had a, an epiphany at a, a very unusual dinner. It was unusual uh, because, well, one reason is the, the host of the dinner at some point was firing a crossbow inside the, uh, uh, inside the room, which was uh, quite memorable. But more memorable was a conversation I had with a, a, a couple uh, who, were, uh, who were professional musicians. Uh, and something which always, I asked them something which uh, had, I'd always wondered about was when I studied music when I was younger at a very amateur level. When you learn a song, you'd memorize it. You know, you'd know where all the pieces, where all the, you know where every single piece went. And I, it always blew me away, this very minor fact in, in all the things that professional musicians do, that very long pieces, they would not, um, but how would you memorize the entire, an entire symphony? How would you, uh, how would you memorize where you fit in with absolutely all the other instruments? And the answer was in retrospect really obvious, which is obviously they don't. Uh, and they, they just, they, they know the music, they played it. And there is a few key points. You remember once you start with a certain phrasing, it just carries you on and it's obvious what's next and you do the rest. And I realized that it's exactly how um, we understand the world mathematically, which is for example, in a proof, you don't memorize every line of a proof unless you're taking the Tripos in Cambridge 100 years ago. That instead you just uh, know how it starts and roughly uh, the direction it goes, and that's enough to let you repeat it. And any proof that you can remember that way, you really remember. And any proof we have to memorize, remember, oh, there's this one trick. That's a hard proof. That's a hard one to remember. That, that's one you don't understand as well as you think. So, um, uh, great. So now let me go to I, now i would love to at some point pause and ask for questions and the 20 minute delay sorry 20 second delay means that this does not work well i don't know whether the shepherds have something they want to if there's anything we have no substance yet perhaps but if there's a question or a comment I'll, about, I'll let you know when questions come up great okay so normally it's a bad thing when questions don't come up but i think given that there's no content yet uh, uh okay so now to the actual uh, mathematics. I should say from the start that my point of view in algebraic geometry is uh, uh, not my own. Uh, it's, sort of, it's, it's inherited from many others. Uh, uh, I think of it as, uh, I guess, Joe Harris gave me uh, a heart mathematically. Brandon Hassett gave me a brain and uh, Johan de Jong gave me a spine. Uh, and I probably learned the most. Hey, Robbie, yeah. could you speak a little slower? Sure, thanks. Uh, so, and I probably learned the most from people who were allegedly my students uh, in one way or another. Okay, so good. Uh, the time is 8.30 here, which is so exactly where I want to be. Uh, and so my, my first, uh, the first thing I want to discuss is why you should care uh, about algebraic geometry. And I don't want to say too much because if you don't know, really, you probably shouldn't be here because uh, it's an important question, but it would take a long time. There's, there are very, very many reasons to care. Uh, but, uh, but I just want to say things that attracted me to the subject uh, early on, too. So uh, here's, a, here's a flavor of problem that you, that you reasonably might have seen when you were, uh, when you were small. Uh, it's, uh, you might have heard, so I guess Fermat's last theorem is something you you hear about uh, and you're trying to show that they're known non-trivial integral solutions to something like this and we know thanks to Wiles and Taylor Wiles that that uh, that, uh, that it's true uh, and when you hear about this you can't help but think about the case where it's false where uh, you have the question of Pythagorean triples and with Pythagorean triples so something is different for two uh, than for three and up uh, that there are answers when n is two, and there aren't answers when n is not two. Uh, and uh, so with Pythagorean triples, you could try to find them all, and there's a very nice way of finding them. You can describe it 
depending on your point of view, in very different ways. And one way of doing it is by uh, one perspective, and I guess they're all somehow equivalent, is to instead divide by, look for rational solutions to uh, uh, rational points that lie in a circle. And so now, uh, just to emphasize, when you ask the question, you're looking for rational points on a circle, but you drew, uh, I hope you drew, you would draw a circle. Uh, which are the real points. And so why did you do that? What, uh, what advantage is there in writing down the real points? Uh, and the answer is, there are of course many advantages. It lets you think about this in a practical way. And perhaps uh, if you've seen this before, uh, and if not, this may come up later again, that one trick of getting all the rational solutions is noting that there is a single point that you can identify easily. One squared plus zero squared is one. And if you take any r r line through it, y equals m x minus one, uh, any with rational slope, the other point will have to be rational. And conversely, if you take another point which is rational, you will get a line with rational slope. So you get this nice bijection between rational slopes and most of the points on the circle. So that's geometry, but it's also it's also arithmetic. Now let me. Uh, have it always add that okay great so that's um so now how about x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n well you could graph that and you can get something which looks i don't know like that probably uh and uh so so you get something which looks like this uh and so let us uh so we're looking for rational points here and trying to see that there are only these four that are present so, uh, so what should we do? So, uh, and the old trick doesn't work. So what do we do? Well, here's a crazy thing to do, which is let's look for complex solutions instead. And there are lots of complex solutions. Uh, again, let me just quickly go to u to the n plus v to the n equals one. And so it, tur so it turns out that the complex solution forms something that looks like a, a, that's a complex, it's a real surface, except it's missing some points, it's missing n points. Uh, but that doesn't matter too much. And so on it, we have these four points. So on this, in this complex picture, we have the real points, which are just kind of around here. I'll leave as a question as to how it interacts with these holes. And then the ones we actually care about, the rational points, of which there are only four secretly on it there. So why, wh how does it help us, in this case, to, to think about this curve uh, and think about this Riemann surface? Well, there's this amazing conjecture which is later a more amazing theorem, uh, so, uh, which, uh, which is Faulting's theorem. One of the uncountable number of Fields metals that, build, that is done in the language of algebraic geometry, which says the following thing, which is you're interested in rational points. So you look at complex points instead. And if there are, is more than one hole, if the genus is bigger than one, uh, so this is something about geometry, it's about topology, then there are finitely many rational points. And that's just weird because these points are nowhere near the holes. They have nothing to, they have nothing really seemingly to do with them. So there's some magical, something very deep magical uh, that's, uh, that uh, is going on that we knew for, uh, for decades before faultings appearing to be, appear to be going on. And something linking the arithmetic, the geometry, uh, the arithmetic, the geometry, the topology, uh, and the algebra. Uh, and so, uh, so, that, so that's a flavor in the Vey conjectures. I, well, I should not do something like that. Instead, the Vey conjectures are a different flavor uh, that also show something uh, miraculous. And just roughly, roughly to say, Store that. Uh, roughly to say what, what the Vey conjectures are about, uh, at least as an idea, if you have something in C to the N and it's cut up by a bunch of equations, and let's say they have integer coefficients for what you'll see why. Uh, and so you've got something in C to the N which is cut out by, uh, uh, so we're inside, I can't draw C to the N, so I'll just do that. And you have this thing which is called a variety. And I could say this in a much more general way, but let me just say it this way. Uh, and this variety has some topology. It's got some different holes of different sizes. So that's about topology. 
Uh, and instead, what I could do is take these equations and I could just take the mod p. And when I take these mod p, then the integers mod p form a different field that looks very different, just p minus one elements seemingly. And so I could just look for solutions mod p. So this is about, this picture is about looking for solutions over the complex numbers. And this is about just counting finite number solutions mod p. So, uh, uh, so in effect, what this is saying, what the vague conjecture say is that by, under, by counting these solutions uh, over finite fields of, of, of general sizes, you can actually then, that tells you about the holes, about the topology of the complex thing. And conversely, if you know the topology of the complex thing, it tells you about solving things mod P or in all sorts of other fields. So once again, uh, something very continuous uh, connects to something that's somehow very discrete. And then the very last example I'll give uh, is, uh, if you've seen the gauss binet theorem, or maybe you've heard of the riemann rock theorem. And then you, uh, so there's a whole bunch of things that grow up to be, uh, on one hand, the uh, Tia Singer index theorem. And really, it all came from growth meek riemann rock and uh, which of course came from growth meek not riemann rock uh, and, uh, and it was his ideas which led, which made it clear what to do on this side as well. I'm not belittling the Tia in Singer by any means, of course. Uh, but uh, what are these all about? It's about something discrete and something continuous being the same for no good reason. Uh, uh, and so that's, so these are the kinds of things, this, these dramatic mingling of different parts uh, uh, that make that uh, I find interesting. So, uh, and so maybe some themes we'll see soon are things like uh, when, I, when you see the polynomials, you should think of this as being a smooth curve. Uh, and that's even true for polynomials over in one variable over an arbitrary field. But also when you see the integers, it's also a smooth curve. And what does that mean? Well, all sorts of things need to be made sense of, such as it's one dimensional and it's smooth. And how do you even define those things? And what's the set and things like that? Uh, and another thing is what is projective space, which has many different answers, and somehow every single one uh, opens up uh, something deeper and deeper. Okay, so now I am ready for uh, to actually get to some uh, to category theory. Okay, so here's some categories for the thinking mathematician, and I should say what I want uh, at the at the end of this, probably later today, or maybe if I'm too tired tomorrow. I'll put, I'll put up some problems and some readings that, and aim them at people who know different things. So I'm hoping that people who've seen proofs uh, already and think about modules will be able to comfortably read uh, up to section 1.5 in the rising sea, uh, but skip all the starred sections. So anything starred is not as hard in the sense I described it, or at least we don't need it, uh, even if it's not hard in some deeper sense. So, uh, and in particular, if you're seeing this for the first time, uh, uh, the notion of universal properties is the fundamental lesson I want to get across today to people who haven't seen it. So, um, okay, so, so let me now quickly answer the question of why are categories? Why is, it, why are, why is abstract nonsense? And so, uh, so categories uh, are, are supposed to be nothing more like any mathematical object, it's something, these are things you've seen before and we abstract away and there's some value in doing it. So uh, there are lots of uh, parts of mathematics you've seen, like vector spaces, there are a bunch of vector spaces and there are linear maps between them, or there are sets and there are maps between them, or there are topological spaces and continuous maps. We, basically you have things uh, and you have uh, maps between them. And I, uh, and so these things can be vector spaces. Uh, Robbie, some people are saying your handwriting is a little unclear. That is, I would say that too. Uh, let me let me try to be a bit more. This is a danger of having my original slides invisible. Uh, so let me. Great. Actually, also, unfortunately, with the twenty second lag, it's bad. Let me know if uh, if things get particularly unclear. Uh, so, okay, so, uh, so what's a category? You've got, got a bunch of things and we have to be fancy so we don't call them 
things. Uh, we call them uh, we call them objects, uh, and we don't have maps. We just call them morphisms. But you already know what they are. And what property do these things and maps have? In all the examples, you know. Well, you know you can compose two maps so long as the target of one map is the source of another. Uh, you also know that given an object, there's a notion of an identity map. If it's a vector space, it's identity matrix. If it's R to the N, it's identity matrix. Uh, if it's a set, it sends every element of the set to itself. Uh, you also know that when you compose, so you, so you have this information, and you also know that when you have three maps in a row, that if you compose these two, and then that one, it's the same as composing this, this one, and then the composition of these two. So those are, you, you can write them down as axioms, and if you, uh, there are all these foundational questions in set theory, which I will ignore. If you want, you can not ignore them. Uh, I feel like you should only not ignore them when you really want to not ignore them, or you will never come back uh, from beginning that. Um, so that's basically what a category is. And now, uh, and what you should do if you haven't seen categories before, to emphasize that there's nothing new, just write down as many categories uh, that you already are friends with. Uh, but as soon as you make the notion of a category, you automatically have the notion of an isomorphism, which is between two objects, which is you have two objects, and isomorphism is a map from one to the other, and there must be an inverse map. So the combination of these two should be the identity on this one, and the combination of these two in the other direction should be the identity here. So you already know what an isomorphism is. That's nothing new. And you have the notion of an automorphism and maybe an endomorphism. Uh, and as a good test, a really parsimonious definition of group uh, is uh, a, a group is basically a category, not basically. You could basically define it as a category with one object and all morphisms or isomorphisms. And that's why, is this the best definition of a group? I would say uh, in one metric, it is the best definition of the group. And another metric, it is so much the wrong definition, it's not funny. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, okay, so, so, uh, so now comes the uh, examples I want to, uh, I want to do that, uh, which is uh, the first example is that of, a, of products and then moduli spaces. And then both of these are gonna be examples of universal properties and that will be, oops, not universities. And then that's where I'll end, unless I informally define a sheet for you too. Okay, so, um, okay, now what I'm about to say, it's, this is called abstract nonsense for good reason, but I don't want your eyes to glaze over. And if you've seen this, if you've not seen this before, you're gonna be tempted to think that you'll just read it later, but it's, it's, the thing about it is it's actually really not hard. It just is, uh, it just changes the way in which you see the entire world. So the first example is that notion of a product. And when I say product, what do I mean products of? Well, you know lots of examples of products early in life. So you know about products of sets. Uh, I mean, even products of numbers comes from your idea of products of sets. And you know about products of vector spaces, products of groups, and uh, products of, if you have a, you should have an intuitive idea of what a manifold is. You don't need to know a precise definition, but you then realize you have an idea what a product of manifolds is. And I want to point out that when, at some point, people are just calling them products, and what right, you should be complaining, what right do they have of calling them products? One possible answer might be that, well, maybe it's often they're product sets, and they have some additional structure, but that's not a great answer. They deserve the name product because they have something even better in common. Uh, and so let me describe what that thing is. So if you have, if you have two sets, U and V, and just to let you know where I'm gonna go with this, I'm gonna later on say that everything exactly the same with vector spaces or groups, that I will define something called U cross V. Uh, and so, wh so, what, wh so what is this thing? Well, I'll tell you, I'll define it in the following way. Uh, and it's, it's something which is going to have maps to you and to V. And this is the thing which I'm gonna call the product, not just this thing here, 
but the uh, also with the maps to u and v. Okay, that's not yet a definition. So here's something which is almost a definition, which is uh, if you have anything that with, that has a map to u and a map to v, then there's a map to the product. And better yet, it there is a it's unique. There's a unique map that through which uh, through which uh, this factor. So the map to V is this followed by projection. The map to U is, uh, is, whoops, that's long, is the map to U is this followed by that projection. Oh, you might as well call these projections. So I, so I claim that's my definition. Uh, and it's, uh, so, and that that's a really good definition. And you might think of, okay, for sets, you know what this is. This is supposed to be ordered pairs. And for sure, if you have a set mapping to one set and another set, you get, you do get a map to the set of ordered pairs. So, so far, so good. But, set, but then I tell you that my notion of product of sets is not yours. In fact, I don't write them as ordered pairs. I write them in the following way, uh, as, as things, as a U on top of a V, like that, where little U is in capital U and little V is in, in capital V. That's my notion of a product. It's like a, some sort of strange vectory thing. And you write it this way. And I say, that's my product. And you will likely say quickly that, well, that's dumb because obviously ours are the same, uh, really have the same information. But let me just make it more, uh, rather than waving hands, let me say the following thing, which is you have your product and I've got my product, which I call, I don't know, uh, I'll call it that thing here. And so I, I claim that mine, I know yours satisfies this and mine satisfies this. Now, this is why they are the same. So, um, so yours has, comes with a map to U and V. And my comes with a map to U and V. And by your universal property, I know that anything mapping to U and V, such as that, uh, such as mine, that that's exactly the same that information is. There's a unique map like this that, uh, that makes this diagram commute, that makes these triangles, that factors this into this and factors this into this. And similarly, if we trade places, there's a unique map from yours to mine because mine satisfies a universal property that, uh, uh, that, uh, that makes everything commute as well. And when I, uh, so, and, and when I combine yours and mine uh, to get a map from mine to myself, or I can combine, do the same thing from yours to yourself, uh, I claim this is the identity. Why is that? Well, here's the maybe bizarre thing. Use the universal property on you, on mine, with it and itself. The first map to U and V is the one I actually started with. And the second is by going through your, going through the, the magic mirror and doing it on your side. So the, so the identity map, uh, there's an identity map uh, uh, that makes, uh, and there's also this map, which makes everything commute. And because by universal property, there's one and only one map from my space to itself making it commute, uh, uh, then this combination must be the identity. So these two must be isomorphic. So that was, there's just no way the first time you hear it, you don't find that incredibly confusing. Uh, and you, this is sort of thing you cannot say out loud without people laughing at you. But you have to think it through while you're walking around and realize that in some sense, there's nothing really there once you think about it the right way. And the advantage of thinking about it the right way now is I can now define products of manifolds. And I would say exactly the same thing, or products of rings or products of groups. And I've got the same definition. And the only problem with this is it's not exactly a definition because here we have, uh, in this example, two different things which are deserve the name product, but they are isomorphic. They're not just isomorphic, they are, they are canonically isomorphic. There, there's one choice of isomorphism that, uh, that makes this work. So no matter if someone else, come, a third person turns up with a different product, as long as they satisfy that universal property, we know not that they are the same as ours in a really strong sense, but there's a unique isomorphism between ours and theirs. So that's the, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the single most important example to figure out if you did not understand it. Okay, so now let me try one more. Uh, let me first of all, make sure this is saved and great. So now comes the notion of a modular space. And I don't know who to credit this to, other than generically growth and deep. Uh, but uh, oh, sorry, some some people are saying that sometimes you point to things and the pointer doesn't doesn't 
track uh, seems to be happening. Yes, that is because I'm pointing with my pencil and you cannot see my pencil on the screen. That is a very good point. Uh, let me see whether, now that, of course, the downside is, uh, let me maybe restate this and see if this helps. Is that, or is that just gonna be a lost cause? Let me there's, find a, there's a laser pointer You're using notability, right? I am, and I could definitely do this. But I have to, the main problem is I have to remember to do it. Uh, so, okay, okay. <laughs> I think just in the future, it's probably a good idea. Sadly, the problem of remembering to do it is not going to be, uh, is, is a, it will remain a problem, but please remind me uh, when, I, uh, when, I, when I do it. So there we go. Now I'm remembering when it's not so needed. Uh, okay. So the notion of a moduli space, I want to point out things you already know, which is if you wanted to say, what are the circles uh, in the plane? Then you might quickly say, well, okay, they're things of the form. Uh, you might write them down like this. And so they're parameterized by two real numbers and one positive number. So, the, so the, they're parameterized by, I guess, r cross r cross r plus positive real numbers. So we know in some sense there's a natural space. So there's not just a set of circles. We naturally think of it as a manifold or some very nice, something much better. Similarly, if I said about uh, projective space, let me talk about RP, uh, RP2. And now I would like to do something visual, but I don't know. I have to, uh, while I'm not looking at what you can see, I will just attempt to stare into the camera uh, and, and, and see if I can make this work. Uh, so what is RP2? Well, one possible answer is you think about three space, which we the first approximation live in, and we consider the set of lines through the origin in three space. Now I'll take this down. Now I really am using my pencil and forget, oh, I'll ignore, ignore that part. So the, the points in projective space correspond to lines through the origin. And when you say it this way, you can believe that it's not just a set of lines in the origin, like there are two degrees of freedom, RP2 is two dimensional. And so that's a point in projective space, that's a path in projective space, this is a loop in projective space. This is a non-contractible loop in projective space. That we, something is telling us that we have a notion, not just of, a, of, a, this, of this as a set, but as something better. So now let me uh, take us to Riemann. Uh, so let's say we wanted to consider Riemann surfaces. You don't need to know precisely what these are, other than they're complex surfaces. And you can't read that, I know. And this one has three holes, which means the genus is three. And then it turns out that there is a nice notion of a space of such things. Now, what does that possibly mean? Well, the space, which is called M3, and now people will know that I'm, some people will know that I'm lying, but they will also know that I'm not lying in a, uh, it's, a, it's, a it's actually a fairly serious lie. But it, it, it's a, a lie because I have your best interests at heart. So, um, so, uh, so we have a modulized space of such things. What do we mean by that? Well, this thing is basically a manifold. It's actually an orbifold, and we'll worry about that much later, uh, if ever. But what, what does it mean? Well, you have the set of such curves, of Riemann, such Riemann surfaces, and it's just a set. So how, why does it deserve to have the name of a manifold? Well, the answer is, if there is such a space, uh, what it should mean is that anytime I have a family of, of such curves, let me just describe it. So I've got anytime I write some family of such uh, Riemann surfaces like that, what do I mean by family? Well, we need to make that make sense later on. We have some nice family of Riemann surfaces, then to every point down here, there should be a corresponding Riemann surface. So there should be a, a point in this this thing, which might just start off being a set. So in other words, the families correspond to maps to this thing here. And now that means that we have defined what this thing is up to unique isomorphism by exactly the same argument. There's one and only one such thing that satisfies this property up to unique isomorphism, assuming it exists with the big caveat that uh, if it exists, if something satisfies the property, it is unique up to unique isomorphism. In other words, that means that we have every right 
to call this a manifold is one, it's not just a set, it's something which is actually a manifold. Sadly, it doesn't exist. So that's, uh, that's part of the, uh, that, that can make you sad, but it can later make you happy too. Okay, so let me, uh, so, uh, and so the very, so these are both examples of, of constructions by universal, of, of, of things defined by universal property. In all of these cases, what you need to do is show that it actually, uh, show that it, you have to show what it is by universal property and then show that it exists. And once you've done that, the universal property can actually be a huge help. So in the last few minutes, uh, what I think I would like to do uh, is, to, uh, is uh, to quickly say what a sheaf is, mainly to seed your mind for in the future to convince you that this is not a scary notion. So the, uh, and, then to, and then just to conclude by wondering where things go from here. So maybe let me uh, start with the notion of a sheaf. And so what is a sheaf or why is a sheaf? What I'm instead going to do is tell you examples of a sheaf of sheaves, and then we'll later next week abstract what we mean by that. So here's an example. So consider some nice, nice space, maybe a manifold, or I think something really concrete, like the like the like the desktop in front of you. And so I'm going to ask, uh, my question is going to be about uh, continuous functions. Uh, let me do, let's do continuous functions on X. But I don't want to have, uh, all, uh, but I want to think about it in a really uh, better sense. I want the information of continuous functions on all of X, there's X, but also on any open subset of X. Uh, and so, uh, so let me call the sheet, this, the continuous functions, let me call this is an O of U to be the continuous functions on U. Now I'm going to observe that a bunch of things which are just obviously true. First, this is a ring. You can take two continuous functions on U. You can add them. You can multiply them. Uh, uh, you can subtract them. So that so 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 it's definitely a ring. Secondly, let me save this. Secondly. Uh, secondly, that if we have, there's X again, in case you didn't remember it. Uh, if you have a continuous function on U and you have a smaller open set, you can restrict a function on U to the smaller open set. In other words, there's a map of rings that's a restriction map from U to V. And furthermore, if you had an even smaller open set, you could restrict to, to V, take a continuous function on the big open set and restrict it and restrict it or you could restrict it all at once and you get the same thing. So this says that this diagram can use. So these are all obvious things about continuous functions. Now there are two further things which are uh, also obvious, but actually have a somewhat different flavor, which is the following thing, uh, which is that if you take X and I have an open set and I cover it by a bunch of other small open sets and they cover you, and let's say I have two functions on U, two continuous functions. And let's say they are the same on each open set. The restriction to each open set are the same. Well, then they must have been the same function on U to begin with. You, that's, this is, uh, that's, that's clear because that's how functions work. And similarly, uh, if you have functions, I'm just gonna say this in words. So, uh, similarly, if you have functions on each of these smaller open sets, and they agree, if, if the function on this one and the function on this one agrees on the overlap, we can glue them all together to make a single function on the big open set. So in other words, the function, if you have functions locally and they glue together, they agree on the overlaps, then they come from something on all of you. So that, I'm just stating obvious facts about continuous functions. And now I will tell you obvious facts about differentiable functions, which is, uh, let me call O of U sloppily the differentiable functions on, on an open set. Or if you want C infinity or something else, then you can restrict them uh, to smaller open sets. And if you have differentiable function, uh, two differentiable functions on U uh, and you restrict to the same functions on each thing, each thing is in a cover, then they must be in the same differentiable function. And finally, they glue together well. And the same is true with, I don't know, uh, C infinity functions, take your pick. 
And so that's some commonality in all these cases of things that look like functions. Uh, and so that is, so I've not defined a sheaf at all, and I'm not going to, uh, but I've just made some observations. So let me now finally just sum up by saying we're at the, we, we've reached the hour mark, and uh, this is intended not to summarize or be a week's worth of, of things, but to set people up uh, collectively for a week, and it will be a different week for different people. Uh, and uh, so what comes next and uh, what happens next week? Well, next week, I, I know mathematically roughly what, where I want to go, but how this is going to work for us collectively, I uh, have ideas, but I'm not actually sure, and a lot will depend on uh, what, hap what happens or, uh, with you collectively as well. So if you, um, so essentially I want as many people as possible to be thinking about things at the level that's right for them to push the envelope of their understanding. If someone is near the edge and falling off because of, uh, they're just barely holding on, then, uh, then reach out. I bet we can actually, uh, we'll try to keep you on. Uh, uh, or if it's too much, that's quite okay too. And if you are a fancy person, you should also be looking for interesting things. I'll try to give you interesting things to think about. And if in doubt, you can always look to the very, uh, there's some rather uh, amazing senior mathematicians who are, quote, participating, uh, and they are, and you should ask yourself what they're getting out of it. And it's something different, but it's something non-trivial.